Thank you guys all so much for attending. Um, I think all of you in this room know me. My name is Elizabeth Samberkey. And it's really an honor today to, well, A, be getting done to finishing residency, um, but B, to be able to present to you um, something that I have been really passionate about since I was a medical student. Um, so I think many of you know, in addition to doing uh, medical school here at Stanford, I also did business school. And I took really two pivotal classes in, uh, during my time at the business school. One was design for extreme affordability, and the other was biodesign that I think just helped me see my five clinical years uh, through a lens that I otherwise would not have seen. Um, so I'm here today to share with you um, some of those experiences, and I really want to take you through the process from conceptualization of something that you think might be a good idea, um, in some cases all the way uh, to commercialization. <laughs> So conflicts of interest, I don't really have any. Um, I will get to this at the end, but I'm embarking on a new project. I'm gonna be the co-founder of a device called ClearSight, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that. Um, I'm unpaid, but I do have equity in the company. Um, I've also been working with uh, the Life Science Angels group as a fellow. Um, Life Science Angels is a group of angels and angel investors. They have a really diverse set of backgrounds, anywhere from working in biotech to people that have started their own companies before. And they meet on Tuesday nights and basically screen new companies that are coming down the pipeline uh, here in the Valley, many of which um, are actually ENT companies. And I was gonna present some of their ideas uh, tonight, actually a project that Dr. Good worked on, but they're not ready to go live yet. So unfortunately that's gonna be withheld into the fall. Um, and then I previously worked on some other devices uh, that I will, I think, touch on one briefly today. Um, and those didn't really uh, go anywhere in terms of commercialization, but I think they were just really important for me in, turn, in terms of the learning process of how you think about design as it relates to healthcare. So design thinking in the biodesign process. As I mentioned, um, I took two courses. One was at the design school, and that's an entire school kind of dedicated to design thinking. It doesn't necessarily have to do with medical problems, although some of the problems are medical problems over there, but it's really a meeting uh, point for people from all different backgrounds here at Stanford to join together and really solve complex real world problems. Uh, we also have the world renowned um, biodesign uh, program, which is a two year fellowship program, and I took the 20 week course here. And I think something to note is that both of these are really immersive experiences, and so while I'm gonna tell you a little bit today about the process and hope that it will serve as a starting point to either ask me questions or to connect you with people over there. Um, I think in order to really get the full effect, it is an immersive process. And I know some of our residents have been um, able to take the coursework over there, but it's definitely something that I recommend. So you might be asking yourself, design thinking, why do I care at all? Um, you guys are all clinicians, some of you are scientists, but I think uh, rarely do I find someone in medicine that really thinks of themselves as a designer. So I think one of the main reasons, well not one of the main reasons, but one of the reasons you might care is because Dr. Jaffer cares. We got this email um, a little while ago from our chair who mentions that the ENT devices market is uh, estimated to be worth 14 billion by the year 2020. So subtle nudge that it might be something important. Um, I think also being here at Stanford, uh, the number of opportunities here at Stanford to get involved with stuff like this are just really boundless. Um, this is a sampling from my email inbox. This is just over the past month, but you get an idea of if you're on the right email list, kind of things you could be involved in um, across uh, different departments. So this is just in the last month. Um, a telemedicine seminar um, featuring different telemedicine companies, VC investors, and different positions. I know this is something that Peter Wong and also uh, Davut Johnny are very interested in. This is a MedTech hackathon that Stanford is collaborating with in Hong Kong. Um, here's Stanford Venture Studio Ideation Mixer. Um, this one is a bioinformatics uh, seminar that uses different, uh, talks with uh, key members from different informatics companies and Nuna Health, Vena Technologies, and also our own Epic. Um, here's one that's not related to ENT, but maternal and newborn survival, looking at research, technology, German innovation, and action. Um, a talk on how universities drive innovation, looking at basic science and engineering research here at Stanford or even just a simple mixer between the different groups. So everything really is available to you. And um, if anyone's interested in getting on some of these lists, that's actually how I found um, some of the things that I've been involved in as a resident. Um, if that's not convincing enough, uh, other programs around the um, country are getting really involved in kind of design thinking and innovation. Um, 
This is a program coming out of Harvard Medical School. It's called Insight Health. And they have a new one-year fellowship program. It's for primary care practitioners who are interested in design and innovation. And they kind of teach them different entrepreneurial skills, too, for how to design around primary care. Um, this is kind of an interesting program, Cedar sinai um, where I actually have a job interview on Monday. Just partnered with um, Techstars, uh, which, is a, which is a general startup accelerator, but they're a healthcare accelerator. And they just took in a new class of 13 different companies uh, who came to their campus on uh, March 28th um, to kick off kind of a 13-week um, innovation accelerator startup. So they're using doctors, nurses, staff, and patients from Cedar sinai to kind of work with these um, innovators in any area from um, artificial intelligence to um, a new intubation device. Uh, and th those projects um, will be presented kind of end of June. Uh, Mayo Clinic is certainly no stranger um, to design and innovation. Um, their uh, kind of philosophy is uh, think big, start small, and move fast. And they've definitely tried to uh, move some of their more antiquated systems and or devices in the right direction. And finally, one uh, that I know about is over at Hopkins. It's called the Sibley Innovation Hub. And this is kind of interesting because they invite anyone, um, whether it be a physician, a nurse, a staff member, a patient, a patient's family member, to submit anything that they think would be good ideas or innovations. And they'll kind of work on it in the lab and see if it goes anywhere. Really happening not only all over Stanford but all over the country at uh, institutions that we really respect. But I think um, the most important reason that we care about this is really our patients. And like I mentioned before, um, I think taking this coursework has allowed me to see things through a different lens that I saw than I would have had I not taken this coursework. And I think it really makes you open your ears to what the patients are telling you about something in particular that's bothersome to them, something that was a frustrating experience. Or something that's just not working in their life that they have to use every day. So like I mentioned, I'm going to be borrowing from each of these uh, two classes. I think that it's really interesting that the biodesign textbook has a cochlear implant, so obviously very connected um, to ENT uh, and our devices. And like I mentioned, this is really just a crash course, but it's in no way uh, meant to serve as kind of a complete step-by-step um, -step guide on, on uh, design thinking and biodesign. So I think the first thing that the classes really emphasize is that design and innovation is not a flash of lightning that happens to you. Um, it is actually a process, and by, by going through the steps of the process, really anyone, even someone who feels that, you know, I'm only a clinician, I've always been a clinician, and, you know, I was taught these things, and this is the way the world works, can learn to kind of innovate, think creatively around um, the issues that they're so here are the two processes that are outlined by the respective schools. Uh, this is um, the design school, and they kind of take you through five steps. Um, empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. And you can see that the biodesign program has a similar kind of step-by-step uh, -step approach. And a lot of these are very uh, similar. So in, in uh, design school, they call it empathize. In biodesign, they want you to observe your patients. Um, the next step is defining the problem, and biodesign this includes determining whether or not this is a real clinical need. And finally is kind of the fun part, where we get to actually ideate, uh, develop solutions, and bring those solutions back to the users they're intended for, to help us really understand if what we've designed for them um, suits their needs. And something else that's important to remember here is that, you know, a lot of, in this talk I'm talking a lot about device innovation, but it doesn't have to be at all. In fact, the same steps can work for redesigning a system, um, you know, redesigning how we look at, you know, the emergency room throughput or our own clinics, um, or maybe, you know, an outpatient uh, hearing program um, can really work for different uh, systems as well. So we're going to start with the empathize um, component of the process. And this is really, I think, where they spend a lot of the core time in these courses. Actually, weeks to sometimes even months are spent really making observations and building empathy. Um, and there are kind of four key components that they outline. The first is engaging with users. I think this is something we're all really familiar with. We get to see patients all the time. We interact with them in our clinics. Um, <coughs> we you know, see them before and after the OR. Um, we really, as physicians, I think, are, are in a unique position 
tons of you know, patients who are users um, who we can design around. The next few are a little bit harder, I think, for us as physicians. The next one is observe their environment. So I think something to remember is that all of our patients, when we see them, it's a bit in a vacuum. We see them for 15 minutes in the clinic, we see them in our operating room, but we don't really see where they exist for the rest of their lives after they leave our offices. And so if and when you can, especially if you think you have a great idea, I think it's really important to observe the environment that your user actually lives in because almost 100% of their time is gonna be at school, at work, at home, and how do they interact with this device uh, and those environments. Um, if you can, you wanna immerse in their experiences, actually put yourself uh, in the place that they're in, if that's at all possible. And I think lastly, this is a really interesting one, and that's to find extreme users. And I'll kind of get back to what an extreme user is. So observation. Um, I think that this is something that we are uh, innately good at as clinicians, um, just as we're trying to pick up physical findings, et cetera. We're good observers. And I think in ENT, we're particularly well poised for this because we're in both the clinic and the OR, we work with pediatric and adult patients, and we're really working with quality of life issues, the special senses. I mean, our patients come to us with um, their issues with speaking, with breathing, with smelling, hearing, um, tasting, and you know, these are the things that really impact quality of life. It's also interesting to know that about 20% of patents filed are filed by physicians, and so we're really in a unique um, space where we can, where we can uh, really make those observations that uh, move on to actual change. So I'm kind of, I think we all know what engaging with users means. It means taking that extra time to when someone mentions something, maybe dig a little deeper into not only why it bothers them, but kind of the situations in which, you know, it might not be working for them. But we'll kind of go through the others. So in terms of observing environments, um, I think uh, most of you know that I worked on a tracheostomy project as a third year. Um, this is Clarity, and uh, I spent some significant time in the homes and uh, um, schools of trade patients. So this is Clarity on uh, Halloween um, at her school. And here are some other just examples of in her home. So this is her showing me her scarf collection, because she really liked to cover her trach with different scarves. Um, also just kind of how she organizes all her trach equipment. And this is a picture of her home suction machine, which has you know, she's tried to personalize it by putting all kinds of different stickers on it. So this slide just serves to show that like, not only are these people coming and you're doing a trait change and which trait fits and which trait is most functional, but really getting to the kind of deeper level of how does wearing this affect their lives and how might you change something so that it affects their lives uh, in, a, in, a, in a more positive way. Another example, as I mentioned, is an immersive experience. So. Um, and reading a book on design, I came across an example of uh, a CEO coming out of a hospital um, in St. Louis who really wanted to redesign the emergency room experience. And he decided to do that by putting one of his top team members and sending them kind of with a fake, uh, feigned uh, foot injury into the emergency department and videotaping it to see kind of what came of it. And I think that this is the way that we all see the emergency department. It's very... Um, patient-centered, there's physicians, you know, working towards the goals of the patient, and I think very few of us, um, you know, we, I'm sure, have all been to the emergency room, but based on the fact that we all are working here, may have gotten, you know, the red blanket treatment, might not know exactly what it means, but as they reviewed this video, what they really found was hours and hours of this, just <laughs> staring at kind of, you know, the tedium of going through these unmarked hallways, that really the whole process was completely opaque, that no one told the patient where they were going or what they were doing. It was just this nameless hallway after that nameless hallway. And that really everyone watching this three hours of unedited video was left with this feeling of feeling kind of out of control, totally bored, tedious, but also a really high level of anxiety. So when they went to redesign their emergency department, they thought a lot less about kind of, you know, the throughput and triage and kind of this patient experience and what it feels like to look at the you know, ceiling tiles of a hospital and not know where you're going. Um, one of my favorites is really thinking about extreme users. So extreme users um, are someone who either uses a device or process a lot, or it's maybe someone who has trouble with using that device or process. So if you're thinking about cooking, it might be, you know, a professional chef who might have special insight onto, you know, 
how to design a better knife because they're cutting all the time. Or it might be uh, someone like this. Um, this is a woman uh, who loved to cook and uh, had arthritis. And as her arthritis progressed, um, it became harder and harder for her to cook. And so her husband thought to himself, why do we have to have kitchen tools that are painful to use? And that's where OXO Good Grips came from. Um, and I think what's really interesting about this is that uh, the wife, uh, Betsy here, um, she was considered an extreme user because she's a woman with arthritis who wants to cook. Um, however, I bet every one of us have a Good Grips peeler in our kitchen now as opposed to something like this. And we don't have arthritis. And so the point is that even when you start designing for something small, this product was very much designed for someone who had difficulty holding <coughs> cooking tools. What you see is that a lot of times that product can be expanded to a more general population. And I think this is a great example. No one uses this anymore because yes, it's functional, I guess. It feels potatoes, but it's uncomfortable. It's kind of rickety. They fall apart. I bet everyone's kitchen has been replaced with the one on, on uh, the right. Um, here's another great example of an extreme user. This is a uh, family that Dr. Mesner introduced me to. Um, and we have a picture of James McLeland and his sister Jeannie here, and they're actually doing some kind of trait cleanup. But neither of these is actually the real extreme user. The extreme user is uh, the mother of the family, um, Jenny McLeland. And as you can tell from this picture, that Jenny is not only extreme about kind of tracheostomy care, but also about everything from Halloween costumes to everything else. And she, I think, uh, reaches somewhat of celebrity status um, in the tracheostomy world. She has a blog that she talks kind of about her children, but she also has a whole um, page of different tracheostomy workarounds that she's come up with as she's been caring for, caring for James. She has a series of YouTube videos showing how to make your trach change easier for a three-year-old, um, as well as others. Um, and she also is active on a lot of uh, Facebook and other social media pages. So I think what's really interesting about extreme users like Jenny is that they've already done some of the work for you. So you'll find that these users spend so much time and focus creating workarounds because the products that we have designed for them don't work, that you can really get good insight and good ideas of where you might design based on kind of how they duct taped things together so that they work for their home and family. And here's just um, a couple of her examples. She has probably 30 examples, but this is the conversion of just a regular Camelback um, backpack to a feeding tube uh, pump so that it's kind of hidden away and she's taken out the um, you know water spout where you would drink and instead inserted the feeding tube. This is an interesting one. James is always losing his passing Mirabelle. And so this is kind of a how-to to you know, drill a section of the passing mural valve and attach it like a keychain to uh, your trait collar so that it doesn't get lost. But I think these can be really um, starting points to insights with patients as to the things that kind of frustrate them about the use of these products. And neither of these things are things that I would necessarily think of, like, oh, the passing mural valve, you want to make sure it stays with the kid. Um, another great uh, opportunity that we have in this day and age is the use of social media. So. Um, pretty much every disease, every diagnosis has its own social media page. Uh, because of my interest, I am on the trait page, and I probably get updates you know, three or four times a day of things that were posted, and you can really start to sort the issues that people have based on you know, the comments and then their follow-up responses. So this is, um, a lot of people talk about quieter suction machines, so that might be something that you want to innovate around because it's something that you know, comes up frequently on these blogs. Here's another one talking about uh, different uh, trach pads and um, how you might do things to decrease the irritation of the trach. So I think we can also look to users in the world of social media to get good ideas. I think this is a great example of an extreme user. So um, this was a patient of mine and Dr. Devins when I was on the head and neck service. Um, she's very public about her disease. She's published about it. So um, and I've asked her if I can talk about uh, her in this talk, but. Her name is Lindsay Beck, and at age 22, she was diagnosed with an oral uh, squamous cell cancer. And for whatever reason, it wasn't here, but she was treated with radiation instead of surgery, and uh, then recurred a year later, and at that point was treated with surgery and radiation and chemotherapy. And she uh, became very concerned that she was gonna be infertile because of having to uh, have chemotherapy. She got really involved um, in kind of fertility issues for uh, patients that required chemotherapy, 
and went on to start a nonprofit, which then started another nonprofit. She ended up going to Penn Business School. And this is a picture for her in the New York Times, kind of on her work in that, in that realm. Um, but she and I spent a lot of time together, A, because we had a lot of similar interests, and B, because Lindsay had a lot of complications. So when we met Lindsay, uh, she had osteoradial necrosis of the jaw because she'd been treated at a young age with radiation twice. And so we did a fibula free flap on her. Big surgery, all day. And when she got out of the operating room, the first thing that Lindsay mentioned was, I hate this thing in my nose. And we said, what? And she said, this, whatever this is, this feeding tube. So we cut the sutures, hopefully, hoping that it would you know, reduce her pain. But every day when I would talk to Lindsay, that would be her main issue. I hate this feeding tube. It gets in the way when I sit on the toilet, it drops into the toilet, they're taping it to my forehead, they're taping it here. And this is a woman who was walking on post-op day one. I mean, she was highly motivated, but this really bothered her. So when it came time for Lindsay to go home, she said, you know, I'm ready to go home, but I cannot go home with this feeding tube. I have four kids at home, I forgot to mention that. She did have children, four. And she said, there's no way this fits into my life. So she opted and said to have a G-tube placed. Um, we kind of said, no, you know, you only need this for a couple weeks, a month at the most. And she said, no, this is just completely incompatible with my life. So she ended up getting the G-tube. Unfortunately, she had a complication with her G-tube and it ended up keeping her in the hospital for about another week and a half because she had a pretty significant bleed. But I think since meeting with Lindsay, not that I've gone on to innovate around the KO feeding tube, um, but I started asking my patients more about KO feeding tubes and what they think about them. And pretty much universally, people hate them. So I think this would be a really, a really ripe opportunity uh, for innovation. Um, but the point is, is that you, know, you have an extreme user like Lindsay. She's smart, she's committed to her care, but she's also extreme that she has four kids. And she is telling us that this is just not compatible with life outside of the hospital. So those are all some examples of um, empathy building, observation, uh, clinical observation. But what we're going to get on to now is really defining uh, the problem. So um, when we did our observation and empathy building, you know, if I want to redesign around the trade or I want to redesign around the G2, I just want to get as many patients as possible to tell me about their experiences. But here in the definition process, we're really going to take that information, synthesize it, we're going to decide what of everything we've gathered is important. I mean, Jenny McLeland has 30 different trait workarounds. Which ones are going to be important to us? And finally, we're going to reframe the problem. And in design school, they do this with something called a point of view statement. And that's coming up with a very specific statement that you're going to design around. Um, and like the OXO good grips, you know, they were designing around a woman for arthritis who likes cooking, which seems very narrow. Um, but the feeling is, is that only by really narrowing down and honing in exactly what you want to design around uh, can you come up with a design that, uh, that actually makes an impact. And along with this, we're also going to work on determining whether or not there's a clinical need. So maybe this is something a few of your patients draw attention to, but there are other ways that you can find out, okay, does this apply more broadly and is there a real clinical need here? So something else that's important to note about um, the process is that there are various points where we're going to flare and focus. So as I mentioned, the empathy gathering, the observations, that's really a flare component <coughs> of the process where we're just trying to get as many data points as possible from as many people as possible about the thing we'd like to design around. But this is really a point where we focus. We want to have a very specific problem to design around. Later on when we ID, ID a prototype, we're again going to flare because we want to come up with a variety of different ideas to address our defined need. And then later on, as we start testing those ideas, we're going to, again, narrow. So this is kind of an iterative part of the process as you go through these steps. And this is actually not linear. You'll go through these steps again and again. You find that there are different times when you're going to focus and flare. And another way of thinking that is uh, divergent and convergent thinking, which uh, David Kelly, who's the CEO of IDEO, kind of defines in some of his books. Really, the point of divergent thinking is to create choices, even if they're wild, bold, you know, out there ideas. You just want to think of as many ideas as possible. But really, we're at the point now where we want to have convergent thinking. So we're going to have to eliminate, um, eliminate uh, choices here. And the reason we do this, like I mentioned, is that you don't want to make something that really doesn't do anything for anyone. So if you design too big, if you say, oh, well, I just want to make a better, better tracheostomy or a better KO feeding tube, you may end up designing something that's really a one-size-fits-none solution like this that looks you know, fine on a coffee table, but really it's lost all of its utility. So now when we think about clinically, how do we define a good problem? Well, here are some nice key questions to ask yourself. 
how big is the problem? Does this affect your one patient that's bothered by it, or is this on a larger scale? How expensive is the current solution, or maybe lack of solution? Um, is there truly an unmet need? After you research it, you might find, oh, actually someone's already doing this, and for whatever reason it hasn't taken hold, and maybe there's a reason it hasn't taken hold. And finally, what are the economics and market drivers of the solution that you're trying to create? Is this going to be something that's going to be difficult to get into patient hands because of cost, et cetera, or something that will be relatively straightforward? <laughs> so in terms of defining a good problem, this is um, taken from my experience in uh, Bangladesh working with the hospital ICDDRB. I'm sorry, does anyone have water? I'm like really talking up here. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> we can get you one of those camel things and modify it. Yeah, thank you. I'd love to modify it. Speech camel bath. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Misha. All right, so this is uh, Dr. Chisti, um, and he works in that intensive care unit in the pediatrics department at ICDDRB. And uh, this is a patient of his, Ricky, who has um, pneumonia and therefore needs uh, positive pressure CPAP. And so the first thing that we want to ask ourselves, and is this a good problem, is this, is this a big enough problem? So this problem that we worked on was uh, children with pneumonia. And kind of the initial key facts we were given was that every year, two million children die from pneumonia, and it's more than AIDS, malaria, and measles combined. So it seems like a relatively good problem. We then went on to kind of break down the components of the problem. So these patients were getting CPAP, but it wasn't very effective. And we kind of noticed that there were three components of the CPAP they were getting. There was the source, so oxygen. There was the interface, which was the nasal cannula. And there was the back pressure, which they, because it needed to be super low cost, was just um, a squeeze bottle that was kind of calibrated by the squeeze to uh, change the pressure. And what we really tried to focus on was the interface, because when we went there and we made clinical observations, we noted that in order to create a complete circuit, uh, give the positive pressure, the Dr. Chisti would always go around and put his fingers on the interface to kind of like plug the nose around it. And so we started calling those Chisti fingers, and that's also nice if you have like a common language with your team so that everyone knows what each other is talking about. So we'd always talk about like how do we duplicate the Chisti fingers. So in our problem, um, we really focus just on this interface. So instead of just saying, okay, how do we help infants with pneumonia, we really kind of defined our problem. So here, uh, and I can, I'm can i not going to do it in this talk, but I can show you guys the prototypes that we came up with. But here we were really designed for resource strap intensive care providers who needed ma to maintain a closed system of life-sustaining oxygen delivery for the pediatric patients with respiratory disease. So what we ended up designing was really a new nasal interface that could work in the developing world, whereas here at Stanford you have 40 different inter, you know, nasal cannulas depending on uh, the width of the ala and the size of the ala. Here we needed something that was universal that could be used from child to child. So that's what we designed around. Um, so defining a good problem. This is a problem that I recently started working on um, with Dr. Trong. Um, and this is going to be quiet because I don't think I've hooked up this down. But Dr. Tron basically made the observation that people were coming to her clinic all the time um, and showing them videos of, her, uh, of their children snoring or audios of their children snoring and saying, does my child have sleep apnea? And so she thought, you know, I've listened to a lot of these videos and I think, yes, that I can oftentimes tell when a patient has sleep apnea. You know, in this patient, I'd say probably not. You know, I don't see apneic pauses. I don't see... Uh, accessory muscles being used, this is probably just a simple snore. So uh, she kind of came to me with this problem and I thought that's really interesting, you know, can you diagnose um, sleep apnea based on the sound of a snore? But the question is, is this a good problem? So a handful of people have come to the clinic, have kind of mentioned this, but let's go a step beyond to really decide whether or not we think this is a good problem. So let's talk about it in terms of numbers. So about four out of every hundred children carries a diagnosis of sleep obstructive sleep apnea. This is actually a pretty hard number to find. This is a paper that uh, was published by Dr. Fulti, one of the authors, and they actually said it was more like anywhere from two to 10. I've seen the number of kind of three, four, and five out of every 100 children. But the point is, is that as we see in our clinic, it's a relatively large problem. It's also been published that up to 12 out of every 100 children snore. So we know that you know we have snores, we have those with apnea, but are we gonna be able to tell the difference? There has been some literature on this. Uh, so this was a meta-analysis, kind of trying to make the correlation of um, patients' uh, reported symptoms kind of by their parents. 
and whether or not there's a correlation with snoring and sleep apnea. And unfortunately, the data was just kind of all over the place, mostly because of the way we define snoring. It's always six times a week, four times a week, three times a week, often frequently, sometimes. Um, hard to draw any conclusions. But there is some data out there um, that suggests that there are correlations between different um, snoring variables and severity of OSA. So here's a study that came out in 2010 and basically showed just a positive linear correlation between snoring intensity and severe, severity of OSA. Here's another paper um, that actually looks at the fundamental frequency um, that's, that may be different between simple snores and OSA snores. And both of these were very small studies. They were 10 patients, 20 patients. And so I don't think it tells us on a population Yes, this is definitely going on, but it's an interesting place to start thinking, you know, maybe there's something to this. So I think this is really interesting. Um, our uh, clinical practice guidelines, what a better way um, to start to determine if something is uh, a good problem. Um, and our guidelines for when to get polysomnography for sleep disorder breathing prior to tonsillectomy are basically the following. Um, it's not recommended that every child get a PSG. It's recommended for children with comorbidities, so including obesity, cranial facial anomalies, um, Down syndrome, sickle cell anemia. They have a whole list. Or for patients with whom the need for surgery is unclear because there's a discordance between kind of the story you're getting from the parents and what you see in the back of the throat. Tonsils are small, but you know they're reporting all kinds of sleep apnea symptoms. So these are the patients that it's recommended that we get. Um, polysomnography for, but I think a lot of our patients, you know, we might say and see, say this is a slam dunk, the story fits, the tonsils are huge, um, let's do this. It's also recommended that for patients with severe sleep apnea, I, I'm sorry, for patients that do get a polysomnography, that they actually have an in-lab pediatric sleep test. So this is an interesting paper um, by Dr. Uh, Nancy Jing, who is one of our prior laryngology fellows. And she wanted to look at the prevalence of severe obstructive sleep apnea in TNA patients. And what's so interesting here is that they divided, it was a retrospective study, but they divided all of their patients into those who were um, supposed to get polysomnography based on the guidelines and those who weren't supposed to get polysomnography based on the guidelines. Everyone in the study did get a polysomnography, but they looked at, okay, people who were supposed to get it versus people who did, how did they differ? And here's what they found. So uh, all of these patients did get a PSG, but they had 101 patients for which there was no indication and 44 patients for which there was indication. They basically found that the AHI between these two groups was about the same, the oxygenators were about the same, but there was actually a really large percent of patients with uh, severe OSA that had no indication to get a PSG. And so their recommendation at the end of this paper was maybe we should be getting more PSGs more routinely because these patients, we're going to lose, miss out on these, and they should probably be close, more closely monitored or spending a night in the ICU. So their, uh, their um, final thoughts were that more polysomnograms should happen. Well, this is problematic, right? Because PSGs are really expensive. There's no so an in-house sleep study, this, yes. If there's no indication, the natural corollary of that is everyone needs a PSG. Correct. So that's what I'm getting to, though. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> so this is why it's problematic, right? You don't want everyone to have a PSG because it's incredibly expensive, um, range from $2,700 to $8,000. The global sleep apnea diagnostic and therapeutic device market is right now valued at $3.8 billion annually and is expected to reach $6.4 billion by 2019. Yes, this is therapeutics and diagnostics. It's pediatric and adults, but we spend a lot of money on sleep is the point. Here are our Stanford numbers. Um, these are kind of hard to get because you can't get Stanford numbers at all. Um, but the director of the sleep lab uh, sent this to me, and it's confidential, so don't share it with anyone. But basically, they're expensive here, right? Any these, you know, in-house polysomnograms range from two thousand to eight thousand dollars. But even the home sleep tests, whoops, even the home sleep tests are not cheap. You know, uh, seventeen hundred dollars for a home sleep test. Not to mention that. Um, you know, in addition to the cost of sleep studies, especially in pediatric, they're extremely difficult. You know, kids are hooked up to devices, they're in an unfamiliar uh, place, and in lots of parts of the country, they're not even available um, to have a dedicated uh, pediatric sleep lab. So a way to kind of reframe and define this problem is pediatric patients need a better pre-screening tool for the diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea. 
And that's why we're, we're, we're kind of headed with this, um, with this study. So we just started collecting data. Um, we are collecting sound data on all uh, people that come in to get a polysomnography. We're working with the team from CCRMA, the sound engineers, to analyze large number of snore data um, and see how it correlates to sleep apnea. So the goal would be to have an app or some kind of super minimally invasive free device that could at least direct patients to, does this seem like someone that needs a sleep study or does this someone that doesn't need a sleep study? So for all of these reasons, I think this is a really good problem. It's a problem that was made based on observation, kind of the number and data supports it, and it's something that we might be able to make a positive impact, not only for our patients, but in terms of cost drivers. Liz? Yeah. Didn't the Israelis already come out with something like that a number so of years ago and it didn't, wasn't accepted? Well, so I don't know the answer to that. There are a ton of apps out there to kind of analyze snoring, but none of them have actually been verified by any kind of uh, scientific, none of them have really any scientific underpinnings. So they, you know, count the, they listen to the snore, they can tell you how loud the snore is, but what we're doing is actually going into the sleep lab and kind of measuring snores leading up to an apneic event, after an apneic event, and these sound engineers actually feel quite confident that we'll be able to pull out patterns and algorithms, but I don't know about this yeah, Israeli it, it, group, so. It, it was done already. Okay, it, well. It I would be interested to know why it didn't work, because I think it sounds like a great idea. If you could forward me that information, that would be I'll great. I'll try and dig it up for you. Okay, sounds good. All right, so we're on to the next phase, which is really um, the kind of the fun phase, I think, ideating, prototyping, and testing. And um, here we're really going to develop solutions to address the needs that we have mentioned. Um, and this is another point where we want to flare. So we defined our need, you know, we're, we're you know, defining a pre-screening tool for sleep apnea or, you know, a closed circuit uh, CPAP. Um, but now we want to think of as many ideas as we can to address this need. Um, so here, like I said, uh, the goal is to generate many solutions, imagine possibilities, create diverse options. Um, we really want to make ideas physical. So in order to explain each other or show our users what we're thinking of, we want to build uh, super low fidelity prototypes. And we're really building these to think, not to say this is a final product and this is what it's going to look like, but building so that we can iterate on it and get feedback from our users. Um, if we are designing around a system, we want to create experiences instead of just putting things down on paper. And we really want to bring these test ideas um, so that other people can generate feedback and say, well, this would work, but this wouldn't work, and that's really not at, not it at all. That doesn't address the need at all. So um, brainstorming is really critical to this. It's where you start with ideating, and actually design school has even rules of brainstorming. Um, and those rules when you're getting in your teams are defer judgment. Any idea is a good idea. You put it on the board. You don't kind of go back and forth about it. You just put it on the board. Um, headlines. So you don't need to go into all the specific details of how the hinge would work. It's really what's the idea and then we'll build on it later. You want to encourage wild ideas. So even if they don't make sense at all at the time, um, some of the most kind of wild and seemingly nonsensical ideas end up being ones that you can build off of. Um, you want to be visual and kind of sketch or create what you're talking about. Um, stay on the topic. So you want to have big ideas, but you don't want to be, you know, designing for, you know, new traffic patterns if you're looking at a tracheostomy. Um, one conversation at a time, so everyone listens to kind of the person who's talking about their idea. Go for volume. This is a big one. Don't try and get the idea exactly perfect. Just try and get as many ideas on the board as you can. Um, and then build on the ideas of others. Take something that is already up there and go from there. So this is an exercise that I was hoping to do, but I actually don't think we have time, so I'm sorry. It's called the 30 circles exercise, and I brought in all these 30 circles for you guys, but the goal is to kind of spur creativity by having you in, well, it's two minutes. Do you guys want to do it? Okay, but I don't want to go over. So anyways, we'll just explain that exercise. And um, so basically in two minutes, you try and Draw as many things as you can out of a circle. And these are just activities to kind of get the creative juices flowing. You know, if you had a long day at clinic and you want to start thinking and innovating around something, you know, you can do some of these. And I have a whole pile of um, different kind of brainstorming exercises. So here are some of the things that people came up with. This is like a really good one, but you know, eyeball, puppy, button. Like as you just start thinking of things, um, I thought this was also an interesting one because they kind of start using multiple circles at one. You know, drawing a duck, a bike. Um, and just kind of letting uh, the mind wander. 
Um, so here is a very typical scene in the design school of people making these low fidelity prototypes. And really, as I mentioned before, the point is not to create something in its finished product. You know, we have great resources now like 3D printers, et cetera, where uh, projects can get done relatively quickly. But the idea is actually not to come up with a complete workable product. The idea is much more to um, use, use your hands to kind of think uh, and also uh, get feedback. So they have found that when, if the prototype is too finished, people kind of don't give feedback because they're like, oh, they worked really hard on this and it looks really good. And you know, But if it's something that's made out of pipe cleaners and Play-Doh, people are like, no, this is terrible, like next, next prototype. Um, so I think this is a really great example of prototyping. This came from um, a company that came out of the design school called Embrace. And Embrace, oh, I should tell you a little bit more about Embrace. So Embrace basically was seeking to design a new incubator. And they had it all set up. They went to a developing world hospital. They were in the hospital and thinking, OK, here are the incubators, and here is their functionality. We're going to make it a lot more low cost. And they got there, and these incubators were all empty. And they were like, well, why are we even here? We thought the problem was incubators, and now these incubators are empty. And what they found was that the incubators were empty because women were really having babies in the rural villages and couldn't get to the hospital in time in order to use these real incubators. So they kind of shifted their focus and decided to instead design for these rural villages. But that makes the problem a lot harder, right? Because they don't have electricity in these villages. You can't plug in your incubator. And so they had to decide in a very focused way, well, what features of the did they want the incubator to have in order to design for this population, which is a rural village? And so here's an example of their early prototypes. They're basically uh, freezer bags full of margarine, like connected with duct tape and uh, connected to a th thermometer. And what they found was that margarine actually had the exact uh, right kind of melting point that you wanted to uh, keep a baby at that temperature. And so for these women, they could heat it up, you know, in a water bath or whatever, but they would know when it was the right temperature when it had a phase change. And so it's only to show that their super um, low-cost prototype was nothing fancy, but it got the point across so that people could, um, you know, determine if it was if it was usable. And they have estimated to kind of save the lives of 50,000 babies or something with this technology in uh, Africa. So um, this is kind of my last topic. Um, and this is the uh, project that I have most recently been involved in. And I just want to draw your attention to uh, there are many different ways to prototype. I mentioned 3D printing. I mentioned low cost things. But this is an example of kind of a virtual model. And it just goes to show that you really don't need you know, an R01 grant or uh, you know, a big team or a big lab in order to prototype um, that with all the resources we have available today, you can actually um, prototype remotely. Um, and so here is kind of the situation that we're trying to solve. And that's in the pre-hospital care setting, about one in four intubations are unsuccessful. And the reason that they're unsuccessful is usually because there's blood or vomit in the airway. So this is a video uh, I got from Dr. McKenzie um, of uh, blood being present in the airway, and obviously it would be really hard to intubate this patient. Um, there are some things on the market to kind of address this need. This is a uh, light wand, which we don't deal with very uh, frequently. But it is a way to kind of, um, without visually seeing the airway, um, place uh, an endotracheal tube. But there are some problems with it. So first is that you need a darker, dimly lit environment, which in the pre-hospital setting with EMTs, you can't control the environment many times. Another is that um, it's difficult in obese patients. It's also difficult in really thin patients because you might be in the esophagus, but they're so thin that you think you're in the trachea. And finally, um, it doesn't work for people of color. So we thought, oh, well, this is kind of an interesting uh, idea to innovate around. We got a little bit of inspiration from the core track, which helps you to place uh, your feeding tube. Um, and track kind of where it's going in the body. And uh, this was kind of the idea. The idea was that you know we were going to design uh, effectively a strip on the neck that could, could, could guide um, where, where your tube was going so that you could get it to the right location. So when it's in the wrong location, it signifies it in some way. And when it goes to the right location, it signifies it in, the other, in a different way. All right, so this is kind of what it's composed of. It's composed of um, a, it's a piece of flexible uh, printed circuit board. 
um, along with 3D magnetometers and accelerometers. Um, our next iteration, we're hoping we'll have ultrasound, but we're working on that right now. Um, and then it works with uh, just a simple neodymium magnet um, that uh, finds the magnetometers. This could also be applied for something like a video lowering scope that also had a, a neodymium magnet uh, applied to the tip. So basically, like I mentioned, the initial uh, prototype that we have, because it doesn't have to be fancy, um, is does not have the ultrasound. It just has a series of magnetometers and accelerometers. And basically, what those accelerometers do is predict tracheal depth uh, based on this paper, um, which looks at a correlation <laughs> between neck circumference and pretracheal tissue thickness. Um, and so this is obviously imperfect, because there are kind of algorithms based into this uh, neck piece that predicts tracheal depth, but people carry their weight in different ways. Maybe people have more posterior um, fat. So this is just really for prototyping purposes. This is how we built it out. But in the future, we do hope to have ultrasound. Um, and here's some of our uh, early, like low, low prototyping models. So this is, you know, going to correspond to our magnetic stylet, um, and we can just see as we kind of move it across. We we want to it to tell us the magnetometers are going to light up when it's approximately in the right place. So again, there's nothing here that resembles a trachea or an esophagus. It's just kind of proving a concept. All right, so this is kind of what uh, the actual printable circuit board looks like. You can see it's very flexible to fit on the neck. This is kind of our next uh, generation of prototypes. So now we put it on a neck, which is a toilet paper roll, and um, we actually have an endotracheal tube. That ding, 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 when you go in the hole, it lights up. So this is kind of, you know, is our next phase of prototyping. This was a prototype um, that uh, my co-founder, who probably a lot of you guys know, Barrett Larson, he's an anesthesiologist here, um, came up with the, with the initial prototype. But then um, we wanted to get a little bit fancier. So here's kind of the most recent iteration. Um, this kind of uh, works with your iPhone. You can see there's the placement of um, the flexible circuit board. And instead of a light, you can now see electronically if you're going in the right way or the wrong way, even if you're not able to physically visualize the airway because it's covered with blood. So this level of prototype was something that, uh, certainly not me, but not even Barrett, who's a mechanical engineer, had experience with. And so how do you get something done like this without paying a lot of money for it? Um, well, like I mentioned, uh, this we're going to use as an example of um, this uh, virtual, virtual model. So here, like I said, some of the benefits of this doesn't require direct visualization. There's no neck manipulation. It works with a small mouth uh, opening. And it's not affected by some of these other things that the light wand is. Um, and also, we're envisioning that it could be used uh, with a video lowering the scope. So in this case, we use crowdsourcing. Um, so kind of just an advertisement was put out on a crowdsourcing website. And literally within hours, we just had different smaller parts um, kind of being asked for and built out. And you'll get bids within you know hours of kind of trying to build that part out for you. So interestingly, um, it kind of went all over the world. And people kept building on it, building on it. And it showed up at Barrett's front door looking something like this. So it is. You know, we didn't know if it would work. It's super low fidelity. Um, but it was the product um, that you saw him using on the mannequin. Um, so that's it, um, kind of taking a process from beginning to end, um, and as it might relate to ENT. And uh, thank you guys so much. <laughs>